Welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, and today our guest is Elizabeth Wellington, a fashion writer and reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer. In the four years that Elizabeth has been writing for the Inquirer, she's covered everything from finding a pair of blue jeans that fit to covering designer retrospectives at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. She's a witty, literate writer with a wonderful understanding of both the business and the aesthetic side of fashion. Elizabeth Wellington, welcome to the Drexel Interview. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, Elizabeth, I had heard that you wanted to be a journalist ever since you were 16. You went on to be the editor of your college paper at NYU. Then you went on to uh, the News and Observer in Raleigh, North Carolina, where you covered news. Mm -hmm. hard news, mm -hmm. police reporting and whatnot, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you got into fashion mm -hmm. and you came to the Philadelphia Inquirer as a fashion writer? Yes. How did that transition happen? Well, I wish I could say that it was something that I planned, mm. but what happened was, is it, it seems like ever since I got into the newspaper business, I've been there amongst some kind of change. So when I joined the News and Observer in 1995, um, a new company had bought the newspaper, and so, and we got a new features editor. Mm -hmm. um, by the time I became a features writer there, she decided that she wanted to redo the sections in the sense that it would be a, a, a theme section. Mm -hmm. So Monday was to be fashion, Tuesday was to be health, Wednesday was going to be food, Thursday faith, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I think I was the youngest writer on staff at yeah. 25 uh -huh. in the feature section. And I was already writing sort of style, hip hop. I go out at night, write about what I saw the night before. And she just said, Elizabeth, do you want to cover fashion? And I said, no, I don't want to be a fashion writer. I want to make people cry when I write. Like I really wanted to mm. do more lifestyle. Or at the time, that was when human interest was a huge deal. But um, she was like, no, you should just try it out and see what happens. And I tried it, and I started writing. I got a column early on because they wanted a voice and they wanted attitude, and it sort of, it sort of fit. So it was kind of a blessing so in disguise. So it hadn't been something that you had planned. Had you always been interested in fashion? Um, as much as any girl is interested in fashion. Okay. I mean, I didn't. <laughs> I wasn't. A, I was never a label. A label person. Mm -hmm. I was never the type of person that had to have Dior or mm. all the labels. Um, to me, high end was Gap growing up. So, um, but my parents, my mother and my grandmother in particular, in particular always had an eye for fashion. And they, okay. you know, had us dress us up for the holidays. And it was more of a, let's get dressed up because that's what we do as opposed to get dressed up for a status symbol. Mm -hmm. And then from covering fashion, I've learned so much more just about history and people and culture and what people do and why they do it. So it, you really, to understand fashion, you have to understand people and history and why people do what they do. Yeah. It is a window on the culture, isn't it? It's, it's a complete window on the culture yeah. because whatever's going on at that time, whether it's a skinny bag or a jean or a corset, it's, it's totally representative of what's going on in the world at that particular time. Well, you just mentioned a couple of things. I want you to elaborate a little because I guess you are a kind of trend spotter. That seems to be a lot what your columns are often about, mm -hmm. taking a trend and then dissecting it or discussing it or mm -hmm. talking about it in some way. And you mentioned the corset, mm -hmm. you mentioned jeans, you meant, I'm trying to think of other columns you've written about that have the, the heels, the little heels. Didn't you write a column about kitten that? Heels. The kitten um, heels. I think I've mentioned them because yeah. I, I tend to like kitten heels. And those bags. Yeah, um, coach bag? Yo, you just wore a I one just on, wrote the a on the coach bag. How do you spot a trend and what makes it a trend, in your opinion? Um, how do you spot it? Well, you spot a trend just by being nosy. <laughs> and, and really, what I find is, I, I realized that I started getting good at writing fashion when I was writing about the stuff that interests me, what my friends were doing, what um, if I went out to a club or, or out with friends. Um, I'm dying to write a column about people who wear sunglasses inside at night 
because it's the most irritating thing in the world. But people do, but do people it. people do that yeah. now. And if, you, if you're out at a bar or a club, you'll see somebody wearing sunglasses at night, and it's most, in, most annoying. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but you may be doing it in a few months, right? No, I, no, I won't never. Do that. never. Um, but I, you, it's you. I notice trends through conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of because when you, as a fashion writer, people will start talking to you in general because they just want to know. Like, what do you think about people wearing ballet flats? And I'm like, I may not have even noticed that everyone mm -hmm. was wearing ballet flats. But then once someone says it, I do start noticing it. Um, People are wearing ballet flats. Right, right but they are yeah. wearing ballet flats. And why flats are they right wearing now. ballet flats? I think that's a backlash to the pointy toe high heel because those oh. just hurt your feet and you can't walk anywhere in them. So do you think fashion goes like that, that you go in one direction and then you have a reversal or a backlash mm -hmm. to it? I think, I think what happens is people always want to do what they can or what society tells them that they can't do. Mm -hmm. And good fashion designers, like, um, for example, we talk about jeans, like the seven for all mankind people. We'll just start with them because that was the first real big um, premium, now it's premium denim, premium denim brand. And they gave people something that they thought was completely ridiculous, $200 for a pair of jeans. My God, what are you talking about? But people grab, start to gravitate toward it because it's something that's so ridiculous that they have to try. Um, one of the stories I'm working on now is about how <clears throat> there's a counter, there's a counter clash now that kids are doing, and I I think they're doing it because in places in big cities like Philadelphia, New York, um, even parts of Delaware, these kids have to wear uniforms, so they mm. look like everyone else. They look like um, Blockbuster. They look like they can all work at Blockbuster. <laughs> and what's happening is that you have all these bright sneakers and bright sweatshirts and bathing apes and Adidas and all this 80s retro bright loudness. And part of why it's so popular with them is because they can't wear it during the day. They can't oh. wear it. Um, but did you write about uniforms and the way these kids can take a uniform and change it? I did. I love that I column. Would you, would you recap that for us? Um, it was for a back to school issue in mm. August and I wrote a column about how um, uh, about the uniform system and we it was a weird column because we set out to try to figure out ways that kids personalize the uniform and then I just had an issue with it because I didn't want to write a column just as a child that went to private school. Did you wear a uniform? Yes oh. and having you know having respect for what a uniform is trying to do mm -hmm. I didn't want to write a column that said okay kids you have this uniform but this is ways that you can hook it up and make it your own because <laughs> I thought that would be doing a public disservice uh -huh. because the whole idea of a uniform is to teach children how it's, it's to teach them that there are rules that you have to follow mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a child um, and I think that's a major part of, of growing up. If you, if you don't have to wear a uniform, that's one thing. If you, the uniforms are different from dress codes, mm. um, which are two different things. And I but you them did both end up saying some of that but in the Exactly. Yeah. But I, and I ended up, that's why I ended up saying in the column that students, sh you know, if you have to wear a uniform, wear it correctly. Because then it'll just show you how to do things correctly later in life. Mm. Um, but you mean, you could argue the opposite. I want to play devil's advocate, mm -hmm. which is that you can take a very seemingly conventional thing mm -hmm. and turn it into a fashion statement mm -hmm. just by your creativity, which I think you implied sort of in the, yeah. in the column. Yeah, and you yeah. can, and it is, yeah. and, and that's, um, that's okay, but you have to have a limit because mm -hmm. then you don't have a uniform anymore. And I guess, and that's the point that I was trying to make. It's cute if you wear great little earrings with it or your own little necklace, make it your own. Um, but at some point, you have to have your uniform. You have, if you're supposed to look like Blockbuster employees, then you must continue to look like Blockbuster employees. Okay, so you're taking the part of the establishment there, a little bit. Maybe, yeah. maybe, but and that's and it's a weird and that's hard for me too because generally in fashion, I feel that, you know, fashion is where you should express yourself and people should take a lot of chances. Um, you should, you sh you should if if you think that you look good in it, then by golly, you should wear it because who are, who is someone else to tell you what you can and can't wear? Um, and that's kind of how I look at my column because I never wanted my column to be really snarky or make fun of people or <laughs> you know tell people what they shouldn't wear uh -huh. as opposed to give them use a use it as a tool to say I can do it. 
Well, uh, what do you think of the new TV shows? I think you also wrote about that, but I that did. sort of leads into it. Mm -hmm. There are so many fashion shows now mm -hmm. on TV. Mm -hmm. There's this uh, Ugly Betty, mm -hmm. which I sort of which enjoy. comes on tonight. Mm -hmm. Is it tonight? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then there's the uh, America's Top Model. Mm -hmm. Uh, Project Runway, mm -hmm. and what's the other one? Fashion uh, House. Fashion House. Isaac Mizrahi. Okay. What? Give me some of your takes on on these various shows and what you like and what you don't like. Um, I enjoy the dramas mm. better than the reality shows, but that's because I am not a big reality show fan. Okay. Um, I like Ugly Betty because it's more. It's it looks at the cattiness of the fashion industry and it talks about what people are. Um, if you go to Fashion Week, you see that stuff all the time. And it's actually quite amusing. And Fashion Week is the New York New York Fashion, fashion Week sh twice a year. And you cover that for I the do. paper. I cover that. And that is that a really over the top experience? Um, you have to wear very comfortable shoes. I think that's mm. probably why ballet flats are in because all those <laughs> editors were walking around and But don't you have feet. to look very chic? Um, you know, it really depends on what your station is at Fashion Week. As mm -hmm. a newspaper reporter, because we're going to so many shows mm -hmm. and we're not sitting in the front seats, I mean, you want to look decent, but right. I really try, I can't wear pointy shoes, I can't wear, I mean, usually a nice pair of jeans and a jacket mm -hmm. is what, because I'm working all day. It's right. just really Are you interviewing fancy. the designers and so forth? Sometimes. Sometimes yeah. um, it depends on who the designer is. You get to go backstage and interview them. A lot of times I try to plan in advance and interview them before I go. Um, but I just want to say for the record that I cannot get you a ticket to Fashion Week because <laughs> I can hardly I because I can hardly get tickets to Fashion Week because uh -huh. it's it's this huge thing where you have to call in and RSVP and get invitations. Okay, I won't ask you then. You can't. I can't get anyone in. I'm. I can barely get in sometimes. So well, you know, you were talking about Ugly Betty and mm -hmm. the fact that it makes fun of the fashion scene mm -hmm. and all of that. Do you feel there's a lot to make fun of? Um, like any industry. Mm -hmm. um, you have your, you know, your your people. I think the the um, and I think I said this in the story, but I think the the challenge of television is going to find to go beyond the stereotype because in fashion television you have so many stereotypes. You're going to have your gay designer men. You're going to have the evil woman who runs everything. You're going to have the girl who just wants to be a writer and just express herself. <laughs> You know who yeah. who's getting laughed at by the vulture girls who work also work at the magazine and are clawing their way to the top, sort of like um, uh, Devil Wears Prada. You're gonna have that, but to look beyond that and to find um, to find the drama in that is gonna be better. I want to say that I did not I didn't like Project Runway when it first started, but mm -hmm. I ended up liking it this season. Okay. I thought this season was really strong. I haven't seen it, but I've heard good things about it. This right? season is, re is re yeah. was really strong because it wasn't as catty. I mean, I don't mind catty on drama because I think if you write in the drama, it's interesting. But when you have real life people on television just acting ridiculous, <laughs> I have. A pro I mean, that's me probably going into the establishment again. But I just have. A okay. Problem. Well, you're you're <laughs> it's that good girl part of you, right? The private school, Catholic like, school. Yeah, it's like, why would you do this to yourself? <laughs> so. Well, you've also covered a lot of these uh, retrospective shows of mm -hmm. designers mm -hmm. at, uh, I guess there was the Chanel show at the Metropolitan mm -hmm. in New York City, mm -hmm. and then the, the Ritchie show, was there a show of his work? Uh, um, maybe I'm confusing him with someone else, but at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, oh, yes, there was a show, I don't know. I don't know if I wrote about that. I remember going there. Um, I think you mentioned it in one of your columns. Right. What, is it, what do you think of those sorts of retrospectives? They seem to be more common now than they were maybe 10 years ago. Right. You know, I think you might be talking about Elsa. Um, Elsa Schiaparelli. There was Elsa Schiaparelli, and then there yeah. was Iris Apfel. Right. She had a show in New York. I think from an in, in intellectual or just a learning standpoint, they're fascinating. Because if you follow them, you will see so many trends in today's work. Um, that recur, that know, recur, that come back. That yeah. come back. Um, there's a, uh, James Galanos is actually going to be fed at at Drexel. Drexel University is doing it at the the oh, downtown um, the Union League, and okay. he's a um, an 80 year old designer who designed for Nancy Reagan. Yeah. And, and I just did a, I think that's my next column that okay, will be running. Okay, look at it. Um, so, um, but I think they're fascinating because you learn so much about, you have to know where fashion has been so you can see where it's going. Mm -hmm. And if you learn that, you know, Iris Apfel was the first person to mix, well, one of the first people to mix textures 
you know, so that you have um, 